Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jean-Marc Mangin. I'm the uh, President and CEO of Philanthropic Foundations Canada. Uh, I have the privilege of hosting uh, today's webinars. Uh, despite the technical difficulties, we're starting a few minutes late. But uh, I, it's with great pleasure that uh, we are um, welcoming three top leaders on the topic of uh, charity sector reform in Canada. And today's webinar could not be more timely as it takes place and make significant developments in the public policy space. Just last week, Statistics Canada released its report on diversity on charity and nonprofit boards of director, and Senator Retna Amidvar's table in Parliament Bill 222, entitled the Effective and Accountable Charities Act. The bill aims to amend the income tax to enable charities to establish equal partnerships with non charities, what we call non qualified donees, and while still ensuring accountability and transparency. So um, uh, before I invite uh, Senator Ratnamidvar to, to, uh, to say a few, uh, uh, to present a keynote, um, I'll uh, just want to let you know that we have a full bios of all the three speakers uh, today in our, in our, uh, in our chat. Uh, but I, I, I uh, and before I invite uh, Senator Ratnamidvar, let me uh, make the line, line acknowledgement. Uh, it's an important step in, in all of our meetings. And so to begin with, we'd like to recognize the many territories of Turtle Island on which we work and reside. These territories are home to many indigenous peoples who have lived here for tens of thousands of years and continue to live here. As settlers, immigrants, and their descendants, and as visitors, we honor and respect the many indigenous people of this land and hope for a more just future together. So, Senator, welcome. And uh, the the uh, uh, you've, you've been a senator now for for since 2016, and uh, you brought you bring 30 years of experience working in the charitable sector at senior levels of management, as well as serving as a board director volunteer, including the uh, leading a charitable foundation, the Maitri Foundation. Uh, senator, it was a great pleasure that. Uh, uh, you, you've tabled this, you, you, you not only you tabled this bill last week, but you were uh, uh, one of the co-leader uh, co of the Senate report in the charitable sector that was tabled in 2019. Uh, so you, you know the sector well, you've been a champion for a sector. So, so uh, I would like to invite you to um, talk more about the bill and how you see the, 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 the key challenges facing us at this time. Senator. Thank you, Jean-Marc, and, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you on this timely panel. You're completely right. It's timely for many, many reasons, but it's most timely, I think, because of the context of the day and the two related but parallel discourse that are out in the domain. And of course, the first is the new, and I still call it somewhat new, unexpected COVID pandemic, which has brought all of us today to this time of insecurity and anxiety for ourselves and our neighbors and our community and our country. And two, the much, much older pandemic whose sting is only now being recognized, and that is the longstanding pandemic of racism. As you know, uh, the Senate Charities Report made 42 recommendations, and I believe it is now important to view these recommendations through the lens of the two pandemics that I, as I call them. And there is a direct connection with them. And it is this, the people who are most vulnerable to the disease are poor. They work not one, but more than one job, sometimes three, have limited or no sick pay and are more likely to live in dense neighborhoods. They are therefore a very easy catch for the virus. Second, we also know from data that people who are poor work not one, but two or more jobs, live in dense neighborhoods, have no sick pay, are more likely to be racialized minorities. Two different phenomena, but closely linked. And I'm going to weigh in on both in terms of describing solutions as opposed to simply describing the problem. My first and, and primary solution that I'm going to talk to you today will close the gap that exists between philanthropy, racialized and indigenous groups in Canada, and will also have positive effects um, uh, for charities working in international development. My solution 
is an amendment to the Income Tax Act. And it takes, as Jean-Marc said, it was tabled in the Senate last week and, and is titled Bill S-222, thank God, an easy number to remember. And the title is the Effective and Accountable Charities Act. The bill removes the language of own activities in the Income Tax Act and replaces it with new language of resource accountability. Currently, as per the Income Tax Act, charities can only use their charitable dollars on their own charitable activities or grant money to other Canadian charities or qualified donors. However, as you will well know, a Canadian charity will at times need to partner with a not-for-profit, a co-op, a civil society group, a social enterprise, a, a civil society meet movement, or even a for-profit group, because that may well be the best way for them to advance their charitable purpose, especially in places which are far removed from the base of a Canadian charity. Example, Farm Radio International, which works with farmers in Uganda, obviously, needs to work with local farm groups in Africa. In this case, the CRA has issued guidelines which require an intermediary agreement between the charity and the non-charity. And further, the CRA goes on to say that the Canadian charity must exercise direction and control over the stated project. So there's the law, which is own activities, and then there's the guidance, which is direction and control. And you'll hear me use these words often. In, in the course of my presentation. This has consequences for philanthropy and for foundations. When I was president of Maitri, I remember the effort, the work, the time, the money that was spent in creating legal documents and setting in place the oversight mechanisms to ensure that the foundation was in compliance with the law in its work with non-qualified donors. The foundation's mission is the reduction of poverty and in order to advance its charitable purpose, it was only inevitable that we needed to work with local groups on the ground who were non-qualified donors. And I also remember, consequently, the countless audits from the CRA that we were subject to. For operating charities, which, and I imagine most of you provide grants to operating charities, it has an inhibiting effect. This applies to any grantees you may have either domestically or internationally. These grantees, or sometimes you yourself, if you're making the grant directly to a non-qualified donor, are subject to direction and control guidelines. If you choose to advance your charitable purpose by working with others who are not charities, you must create an agency agreement with the intermediary, but then you must ensure that your charity always maintains direction and control over the specific project. Let me provide you with a quick example from Canada. The YWCA receives charitable dollars from Canadians and from foundations. It can further grant these dollars to other charities or choose to spend them on their own programs and objectives, uh, programs and projects, sorry. And the policy rationale is grounded in accountability for tax exempt charitable dollars. So far, so good, I would say. No one can argue with accountability. But what happens if the Y wants to work with, you know, let's say an, a group of Afghani women? in helping them become financially literate, then the best path to success for the YWCA would be to work with a local Afghani women's group, which is likely not a charity, but a not-for-profit. In this case, because the act stipulates that charities must spend charitable dollars on their own activities, it becomes extremely difficult and onerous to affect this collaboration. In other words, if you choose to do that, you are required to operationally run the project. Failure to do so or failure to proving that you are in fact directing and controlling can result in the revocation of your charitable status. And colleagues, I will tell you this, I have studied the case law. All the case law on this matter tells, tells us that the courts are not simply satisfied with the presence of an agreement, but they will look for proof of direction and control. As a result, Many charities and foundations and not-for-profits walk away from a collaboration because there are far too many risks. For the funding charity or foundation, there is all the risk associated by being in default of compliance, all the ris risk of exerting operational control over another entity. And for the funded 
non-charity, there is the real risk of loss of control, agency, and voice. In this context, I was struck by the arguments made by experts that, that this regulation is out of step with contemporary values. It is a condescending approach. It contradicts Canadian international development policy. It challenges the goal of equal partnership with local communities and civil society and is counter to the government's own feminist international policy. I conclude, in fact, that the current laws and regulations that govern the regime today leave a prevailing test of taste of colonialism. In Canada, with many charities wanting to play a role in providing services to non-charitable groups serving Indigenous Canadians as one example. I don't think I have to explain to you how the words direction and control are interpreted by Indigenous groups. No wonder then that there is a very wide space between philanthropy and Indigenous peoples, and also between philanthropy and racial justice groups. So where's the solution? I don't believe the solution lies in reducing government oversight, but in finding new and different and flexible ways of ensuring it, just as the US or the UK have done. We recognize that charities and non-charities must work together. We recognize that safeguards and guardrails need to be in place to prevent nefarious activities, but we do not believe that the status quo is an option, and we do not believe that the current system does nothing more than prove a fiction, forcing charities and non-charities to participate in convoluted contortions. So on this point, I have tabled legislation to amend the Income Tax Act, to remove the reference to own activities, and therefore, obviously, the, the guidance on direction and control, because I believe that we can have both accountability and empowerment. And this is how I will assure that. My bill will give charities the freedom to partner with non-charities in using their financial, human, technological, and other resources to further a particular mission without necessarily having to undertake the legal costs, the uncertainty, and the imposition of colonial values. It will not result in reduced accountability, it will result in accountability gained through different means, not through operational controls, but through partnership agreements that lay out the ground rules, but do not imply operational control by the sponsoring char charity. By charting this way forward, we will be bringing our law laws in line with best practice from overseas. As I said, both the UK and US have enabling legislation that allows for the transfer of funds, charitable funds, to non-charities over overseas with accountability measures built in. In fact, the language in the US is, I believe, expenditure responsibility. I'm using the words resource accountability. It's more consistent with the language in the Income Tax Act, but it is extremely similar to what I'm proposing. To those who are concerned about intentional or unintentional leakage of charitable dollars to nefarious groups, I point out the many instruments of state, including the RCMP, CSIS, FinTrack, Five Eyes, as well as two specific pieces of legislation that deal with the flow of money from charities uh, for nefarious activities. This, this is the Anti-Terrorism Act and the Charity Security Registration Act, which both outline the process for revocation of a charity status when it is in default of the law. There is absolutely no reason in the presence of all these other instruments, there is no reason to rely on own activities and direction and control as a measure of moving forward. Let me move on very briefly to the second pandemic, and that is of racism. When I was president of Maitri, I remember, I think it was 2001, uh, I created a funders affinity group dedicated to anti-racism. Since that time, foundations have become happily far more aware uh, on issues of inclusion and diversity. I have focused my efforts on the diversity de deficit and governance in the charitable sector. I published in the summer an open letter challenging the sector to measure its own, to gather its own evidence and to measure it and so heal itself. Fortunately for all of us, StatsCan stepped up to the plate and as Jean-Marc said, its first uh, voluntary survey is, is out for your uh, perusal. 
and the pub results were published last week. It is not possible to read too much into the survey because uh, it, it is not drawn from a national representative sample, but it does give us interesting glimpses. The sector's governance falls short in almost every group except gender. It has below national demographic indicators for racial minorities, for indigenous peoples, for LGBTQ, for disability. And I'm only talking about governance, about boards of directors. But it also disclosed an interesting finding. Those boards who had diversity policies also had more diverse members. So if there's a signal for action, colleagues, here is, it is. I plan now to urge the government to, to go to the next step and collect standardized annual data through amending the T3010 form and adding a question on the demographics of governance. In this case, we will all get national data. It will be reliable. We can disaggregate it and we can survey it for changes over time. Most importantly, the sector itself can take these evidence-based measures for corrective action. And of course, there's always legislation. The government, by the way, regulates the corporate sector to ensure that annual data and diversity plans are disclosed annually for federally regulated businesses. It could choose to do the same for charities. Further on, on the charities file, I am really crossing my fingers and toes, etc., to believe that 2021 will be the year when the government will finally announce a home in government for the sector. There is a, a little uh, uh, silver lining at this point that I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on to. It is in the mandate of the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. And he's been mandated uh, to ensure that the charitable sector is working more constructively with the government. And there's nothing more constructive than he can do that he can do than create a home in government for the sector. Finally, to money. Because we're in the midst of pulling together a budget and unusual circumstances, there is a flood of ideas in the marketplace. Charities are asking for a sector relief fund. Some MPs are agitating for a matching contribution for Canadians who donate to COVID relief, just like we do for donations to overseas relief. Then there is Mr. Don Johnson's proposal to uh, enable privately held securities and the sale of real estate to be qualified as charitable donations. And then there is the disbursement quota, uh, raising the disbursement quota. I support raising the disbursement quota in principle. I have not taken a position on the percentage. Rather, it is my hope that the government will kickstart consultations on this proposal uh, to identify uh, you know, intended and unintended consequences and to determine whether the disbursement quota should be firmly uh, set in legislation or should it be uh, in regulations. Also on this whole issue, if the government is going to open all this up for consultation, I would hope it takes a look at the disbursement regimes that govern donor advice funds. So thank you. I look forward to your question, questions, especially on the legislation that I have shared with you today. Thank you, Senator. You've raised a, a lot of fundamental issues. And uh, I'd like to thank you again for your leadership on, 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 on moving those forward. Uh, we do have a few questions that have already come in uh, uh, from participants. We have one from Kevin McCourt of the uh, Vancouver Foundation. The text in Bill uh, S-222 indicates that, that it would come into force two years after receiving royal assent. Why the delay? That's an excellent question, Kevin. I struggled with the two year uh, coming into force, but frankly, here's, here are the facts. This is a private bill. And if passed, government and public servants will need to put a lot of building blocks in place. For instance, the CRA will have to establish new guidelines. And in order to do so, the CRA will need to have consultations with stakeholders. All of this takes time. And the law clerk with whom my office was working actually was, was insisting on three years and we were able to pull it back into two. And I'm not sure whether, whether and if this uh, coming into force may be further amended either in the Senate or in the, in, in the House to allow for more time. So let's just, I know, I know two years is not great, but it, it's possibly uh, uh, the best we can do. 
We have time for another question before we move to uh, uh, our other two panelists. And it's a question from Sharon Retsky. And what reforms in particular uh, will be of benefit for indigenous communities in your bill or in the other uh, reform uh, that you, you, you're, you're championing? Well, let me talk about the bill. Uh, I had uh, significant consultations with individuals uh, who are engaged in the philanthropic space, working with indigenous communities, in particular, the circle of philanthropy led by Chris Archie and by others. And I know this, that the current law inherently disadvantages marginalized communities. Marginalized communities are less likely to have registered charities in their midst. It's not unlikely, but they're less likely. So they fall into uh, uh, this weird relationship the government has constructed, uh, this, this workaround that that foundations and charities have to uh, manipulate themselves in order to confirm uh, a, a, a project agreement with, with a non-charity. And that project agreement, and I can tell you all, and you know, your foundations, you probably know this already if you've tried to do this, but the arrangements have to be quite uh, articulated. The reporting mechanism is, uh, is onerous to say at best. There are financial reports, there are sign-offs. The indigenous group, if, if let's say they have a press release, that has to be reproved by the sponsoring charity, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it is no wonder to me that both indigenous groups and foundations are very hesitant uh, to uh, put themselves into a situation where one group is forced to exercise power and control and the other group is forced to accept it, even though the work that they are doing may be really essential and important work. So in this way, by lifting this requirement of own activities, which is then followed up by direction and control and by re replacing it with resource accountability, a charity or a foundation will be able to have an agreement with a non-charitable indigenous group. There will be due diligence, there will be contracts, there will be timelines, there will be reporting arrangements, there will be impact assessments, all of that will be in place, but the charity will not exercise operational control over the non-charity. In this way, I think it gives you, it, it empowers everyone. It empowers the indigenous group and it empowers the charity that is trying to work with the indigenous groups. So accountability, with empowerment. It's not an either or in my bill. It's an and and. Thanks again, uh, Senator. I hope you can stay with us for the general Q&A at the end of-, of I will, yeah. And uh, at, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, both Bruce and Hillary uh, to speak. For those of you who don't know Bruce and Hillary, uh, that you can find their full bio notes in, uh, in, in, in the chat room. But uh, they, they're here today because they, they uh, two of the three co-chairs uh, for the uh, Federal Advisory Committee on the Charitable Sector. And uh, they are about to table their first report. Uh, and so I, I hope we can get some, uh, some uh, insights uh, about, about the recommendation. I know they're not quite public yet, but uh, to, to give us uh, a, a sense from your perspective uh, of, of the key issues facing the sectors and where the priorities uh, should be in terms of, of reforming the, the, the regulatory framework. So on that note, uh, Bruce, I would, uh, from uh, the, the President CEO of Imagine Canada, can you, can you uh, get us going? Absolutely, well, thanks, Sean Mark, and uh, thanks to PFC for the opportunity to participate. It's always great to, to be able to talk about the work of the committee and and also uh you know i'd like to express our appreciation of the senator for her leadership that she's clearly showing on a number of these key issues facing the sector um so the way hillary and i have sort of framed this is i'm, I'm going to kind of kick things off just talking a little bit about the committee itself uh, not assuming that everybody has been reading absolutely everything that's come out about it but just to make sure that um 
people understand the mandate and uh, and the areas that we've been we've been focusing on. So uh, the group came into existence technically uh, late in the summer of 2019, and of course then we headed right into a fall election at that point. So we we really didn't get our work started till after that, and then of course the pandemic hit. So there's been sort of some some downsides and some upsides. I mean the downside that we've not had the chance to meet in person except really once. Uh, the upside being uh, with with members of the committee themselves um, not traveling as much. Uh, the work has just been moving forward at, at quite, quite a pace. The committee is comprised of about 14 individuals from the, from the sector, uh, plus government colleagues. Um, as as Jean-Marc mentioned, Hillary and I are the two sectoral co-chairs. Uh, the third co-chair is Jeff Truman from CRA. And uh, we've been strongly supported by the, the sort of the secretariat, the, the CRA, as well as representation from uh, the Ministry of Finance in, in our meetings. Technically, the, the group is really appointed to make recommendations to the Minister of National Revenue, the, the, the federal ministry within which CRA fits. Um, now, we recognize, as we've had our conversations, that some of those recommendations will relate directly to the work of that ministry, but that there's also going to be other recommendations that are crucial to the success of the sector that go outside the Ministry of National Revenue. So at times, um, our conversations have been around enlisting the support of the minister as an ally in terms of working with caucus or cabinet colleagues to advance some of the other interests that, that uh, we'll have as a group. Um, as we've gotten together and talked, and I think there's uh, some folks on the uh, the call who are part of the, uh, the committee as well, um, we really did use the uh, the Senate study as a blueprint or a roadmap to get started. But of course, 42 recommendations to get going <laughs> is a lot all at the same time. And so we sort of pared it down into sort of five working groups. Um, and those working groups, uh, there's one around uh, an examining a, a regulatory approach to charitable purposes and activities. Um, you know, specifically looking at the impact on charities with, with non-qualified donees uh, and, and charities that are engaging in earned uh, income activities. The there's a second group around modernizing the regulatory framework in government as it relates to the charitable sector, a third around supporting the work of organizations serving vulnerable populations, a fourth exploring charity-related uh, charity regulatory and legislative issues faced by Indigenous peoples and organizations, and the fourth is, or, or the fifth rather, is around improving data collection and analysis related to the charitable sector. So those five working groups, each led by a member of the advisory committee, have been incredibly busy uh, in, in through last summer and the fall to the point where we're getting ready to make our, our first recommendations um, and updates to, uh, to the minister, uh, which hopefully will be sort of uh, received any day now. Um, so with that, I, I'm gonna pass it to, to Hillary and she can talk a, a little bit about, because we don't see this being the end of our work because this is a, a permanent committee. We, we see this being sort of the beginning of the work and sort of talking about a little bit going forward. Okay, thanks Bruce. Uh, yeah, as you've heard from Bruce, uh, this has been a, a very busy committee and the committee, uh, if I could just sort of step back a minute to the origins of the committee, um, it came from uh, the discussion that we had as a sector with the federal government um, around the question of political activities. So I know a number of people on the call will remember that uh, conversation and debate. And that took place um, beginning in the, uh, the Harper years and then uh, through the election campaign in 2015 and on into the first mandate of the Liberal government. The issue there, of course, was the question of what is charitable? What is it okay for charities to do? How does the law interpret charitable purpose and activity? And then how does the government uh, implement or interpret the, the law and uh, implement it through regulation? We, as many of you know, um, we did have a change in that understanding of what is acceptable from a uh, a political point of view. And by the way, the word political is no longer used. Uh, the, the more accurate description is public policy, dialogue and development activities. A rather ponderous description, but, um, but it does get more accurate around the question of 
what charities were engaging in with these activities. And I think the other important point in all that uh, discussion was that it really put the focus on charitable purpose. If a charity has a charitable purpose, as defined in, in common law and, uh, in, and in court uh, decisions, then activities that that charity pursues as it, as it pursues that charitable purpose should be acceptable if the charity can demonstrate that these activities are in pursuit of that purpose. And that leads to what the Senator is doing with her bill. And it also leads to a, a conversation, a long conversation that we've had within the committee as well about this question of direction and control. So again, it's a question of how charities uh, pursue their purpose through activities, some of which may be activities with non-charities. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily all have to stay within this box that is labeled charity to be uh, able to demonstrate that we are pursuing a charitable purpose. I think one of the things that's happened with the interpretation of the law over the years is that, you know, the box itself has been quite constraining. It's been constraining for charitable foundations who have not been able to work with uh, non-charities uh, easily. And it's been constraining for charitable organizations in general. So the Senator's efforts uh, are very much in alignment with the, uh, the discussion that, that took place around the question of what activities are, are charitable and what is charitable purpose and how should one pursue that. And what we hope to do as an advisory committee is to pursue that conversation and to explore other areas in which charities can get outside of that box Again, legitimately always pursuing a charitable purpose, but perhaps uh, engaging in uh, income earning activities, revenue generating activities that might be business-like, but that would be acceptable if we could demonstrate again that this, the funds, the revenue coming from those business-like activities was being uh, assigned to a charitable purpose. One more thing about the, the committee, I, you know, as Bruce said, we've been very influenced by the pandemic. And again, as the Senator said, uh, you know, it is, we are in a situation that none of us have ever experienced before. And it has illustrated some uh, very serious inequalities in our society that of course existed before the pandemic, but which are now very much evident. And certainly from the point of view of the charitable sector, it is, uh, I think, incumbent on the sector to address those inequalities uh, even more so than we have in the past by building awareness, by acting directly on those inequalities, by funding organizations that are working on those inequalities. So the fact that we have at least two working groups of the advisory committee that are, are thinking through uh, the policy issues, the regulatory issues that affect vulnerable populations, uh, I think is a real indication of how seriously we're taking uh, the pandemic and the spotlight that it has put on inequality. So we also, and that, uh, my final comment, um, I think this is an advisory committee uh, that is playing a more than, uh, a more significant role than it might otherwise be playing as simply an advisory committee to a single minister, in part because we don't have any permanent structures uh, in government or uh, in the, in the, uh, the sort of near government, the agency, the, the Canada Revenue Agency is an agency, it's not a department of government, but it's, the, the fact is we don't have a home in government. And because we don't, and we have, don't have any kind of structured dialogue um, that is ongoing, the government has a blind eye to the sector. It just, it, in many ways, it just simply doesn't see the sector as a sector. And because of that, we have lacked investments in the key infrastructural supports of the sector access to capital, access to investments in technology, uh, access to uh, data. These are critical things that affect us all as charities. And I think it's incumbent on this advisory committee to go beyond issues that affect uh, the Income Tax Act or, or the Minister of National Revenue and to speak to government directly about what we need to flourish, to, to really be uh, the effective, productive partner of government that we can be if we want to be. So, I, you know, we do have a purpose here, I think, that is broader than simply discussing and clarifying uh, regulation and supporting uh, the CRA. And, and let me say, by the way, that the CRA officials have been 
amazingly open. Uh, they have been at every meeting. They have supported us. They are listening. Uh, it, it is quite extraordinary, actually, to see how open they are. So I just want to put in that little commercial for them. You know, they've been very, very supportive to us. Okay, I'm mindful of time. I think there are probably questions. So I'm very interested to hear what people uh, might have in the way of questions to us. Great. Questions are rolling in. Uh, so I do invite you to put your question in the Q&A uh, uh, section. Uh, and uh, vous pouvez évidemment poser vos questions en français et la discussion simultanée. Donc, uh, le, le, let's start. We do have a question from uh, Sarah at the Toronto Foundation. Uh, and and the, on the question of priority, we, we, we've heard from the Senator, but uh, from Bruce and Hillary, what's the biggest lingering issue facing charity as you see it right now? Bruce, you try that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, if I was, and I'm not sure, I, I think this has got my more of my imagined Canada hat on that I would necessarily say the mandate of the committee. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the biggest single issue we're witnessing is, is the, the vice grip that is a surge in demand and a drop in supply. So with 46% of organizations reporting that more Canadians are coming to them needing services combined with 68% of organizations indicating that donations are down. Um, what we're witnessing are organizations who are, are struggling just for their organizational health and well-being, looking after exhausted staff and really wanting to meet the demand that their communities are coming to them with. Um, I have the good fortune of, of talking with many organizations, uh, doing two to three calls weekly, just calling organizations across the country. And, and certainly that survey data that I cited, anecdotally, we're hearing much the same thing. And so I, I think really it is this, this moment in time where these two forces are working in opposite directions. And the question is, how do organizations um, both fulfill their mandate and ensure that they're here to a point where we truly are in a recovery period. Hillary, can I? Uh, well, I think Bruce answered the question very well. I, you know, I think uh, we we are still um, malheureusement. You know, we are still very much in um, a coping mode. Uh, the pandemic is not over. Uh, the crisis continues. In some ways, it may worsen for uh, the sector uh, because various government support programs that have been available to charities are going to end. Uh, and, you know, it's not as easy as simply uh, flicking a switch uh, that everybody starts back up again, that uh, everybody's rehired, that it is possible to keep delivering services, that fundraising is going to snap back. Um, I do think the data seems to suggest that um, giving has not plunged. Uh, I think we had a worry at the beginning of all this that, that giving would go down significantly, and it hasn't. I think PFC and the other funder networks have done some excellent work in uh, collecting data that shows that uh, foundations have stepped up, um, that there has been more spending, and this goes to another issue that the senator was mentioning, uh, disbursements. Um, I do think that many, many foundations have gone beyond the, the uh, mandated minimum disbursement, uh, and I do think that there is a lot of individual giving going on, even if event um, giving fundraising, you know, is clearly not happening. Um, so I think the sector has been very creative in terms of switching over to digital forms of, of fundraising that are, uh, that are at least maintaining some of those levels of philanthropic donation. I think the bigger issue is um, earned revenue has plunged, uh, and that's a real problem. So, I, you know, much as I would like to shift to, you know, talking about the post-pandemic, uh, you know, what's the world that we want to build post-pandemic? You know, where are we going? And what's the role of the sector in helping to imagine that, that world? Uh, we may not be quite there yet, uh, but I'm certainly hoping that by the end of 2021, that we've had those opportunities to, and on our beginning to have more of those conversations in the sector about, you know, what kind of world do we want and what's our role in building it? Uh, Jean-Marc, may yes, I weigh in? Yes, go ahead. So I think this is fascinating because the three of us will come at things from a different point of view, but it makes for the for the whole picture. I think the biggest issue facing charities is, is an issue, is how are they going to deal with inequality 
and how are they going to regain the trust of Canadians? You've all seen the surveys on, from Edelman on the fall of trust in charities, whether it's linked to we or not, I will say that the trust can be regained if charities and the philanthropic sector own uh, the, the issue of inequality um, and uh, the way inequality holds people and communities and this country back from its full prom promise and how charities and, phil and philanthropy can uh, restructure itself. Uh, and I'm talking about not just what you do, uh, but how you do it and who you do it with and who you are. All of these are mixed up in your personality. So the question really is, will charities be able, and it's not an artificial pivot, it's a wholesale rethink. Will charities be able to do that? Uh, and I believe that if they do that and they demonstrate their success uh, and their, uh, their uh, uh, focus on this, they will regain the trust of Canadians. Uh, thanks for, for all to all three. I mean, this, con this conversion of, of crisis of our trust, anti racism, the pandemic, the economic recession. Uh, we haven't even talked about the climate crisis. So, so it's, it, it is, it is a, 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 well, a critical juncture uh, uh, for, for the charitable sector writ large. Um, we do have some specific question uh, in, in the QA. Let's let me uh, uh, go through some of those. Uh, a question from Tim, Tim Broadhead, but most of us know quite well. I'm in all in favor of allowing charities to fund non-qualified donees, but how to ensure that private foundations do not fund non-arms like non-charities, i.e. wealthy individuals don't get a charity receipt and then put the money into the, into the other pocket of other wealthy individuals and the money that circles and doesn't get to charitable purpose. So it, it does the bill address that issue and so, and so how? I'm not quite sure I understand fully the question. Uh, I think it has to do, Tim, with a kind of uh, self-dealing. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do the wise thing. I'm going to ask Hillary to answer that question for me so then I can take it to the Senate when that question gets asked of me. <laughs> the, I mean, the, we, we do have a case that CRS has, has done some, some uh, compliance in, in uh, out in out in Vancouver, or it was a, a foundation that as uh, was funding another foundation uh, that were in fact linked with the same family, and and they they they. they, they but but you know the, the genesis of own activities yeah. in the 1950s is actually linked to that very specific problem. Own activities was introduced as a as a measure to to avoid this kind of you know, money going around in circles without ever reaching the community. But in doing, in, in finding the answer, they also created, uh, and, and, you know, I think it was likely unintended that they came up with own activities. Uh, so the genesis goes back to the 1950s, but I, I want to hear Hillary, Hillary's yeah. answer to this question. Yeah. Hillary, please. Okay, put me on the spot. <laughs> I... I think, you know, Tim is right in uh, worrying about um, the possibilities of abuse and, and in general, whenever there's a change like this or whenever we suggest a change, one, one that seems to be opening up uh, as opposed to constraining uh, possibilities, um, then yeah, you know, there is a possibility that someone will take advantage of that. Uh, you know, it is, I think, the challenge of the regulator, you know, does one take a constraining perspective or approach because you have to try and stop the wrongdoing before it happens? Or do you try to take an enabling approach and work with the inevitable problems that you, you may run into, but which are always problems at the margin? You know, it's not as if there were widespread abuse in, in the sector. I, I, I'm not seeing, and I have not seen that. Uh, I'm not saying that it can't happen, uh, but I, I feel that um, regulation has been framed on the assumption that you are guilty until proved innocent, that you should be deterred from doing things because uh, if you are not deterred, then you are going to engage in something that is abusive or illegal or for private benefit. And it comes back again to this question of 
pursuing your purpose. You know, your purpose as a charity, whether you're a funder, a foundation, or you're a charitable organization, your purpose has to be for public benefit. And you have to be able to demonstrate that you are pursuing public benefit. And yes, it does put some onus on uh, the regulator to go after you if you are not pursuing a, a public benefit. But my view is that uh, there is more deterrence of good activity than there is prevention of bad activity with a constraining approach to, to regulation and to law. So there, there is, again, the law, and I want to stress this, you know, the common law does not say that charities are charities because they pursue certain activities that are deemed to be charitable. They are charities because they have a charitable purpose. Therefore, the activities themselves are not the indicator of whether you are charitable. I, I will not exclude that, you know, there are going to be people who try and take advantage. Um, but I do think that um, it, it is impossible to constrain uh, charities universally in this way without having some real loss of public benefit, actually. And that, you know, benefit cost um, equation is not, to my mind, it's, it does not, has not been taken into account in the regular's mind. The, the loss of public benefit that is created when you don't have charities, you know, having a, a broader frame of activity um, means that it, uh, it, you know, it always devolves, defaults back to a constraining approach. And I think we, we need to take a risk here. And it's a, it's a calculated risk. It's a good risk. It's a, it's a solid risk. It's not going to lead us, you know, down the garden paths or, or over the cliff. Bruce, do you want to add anything? I'll just add one, one comment so you can get onto more questions. And just picks up on Hillary's point. I, I mean, I think an underlying um, message in all of this is how do we work with government to unleash the power of social good in ways that are both transparent and accountable? And every time we make a change, we're going to have to poke the limits of that and understand whether we need to adjust that change as we go. But I think moving to this idea of seeing um, charities, nonprofits, social entrepreneurs as contributors so that, that we can actually do more rather than rein in is hopefully a powerful mindset that we're working together to shift. I want to, I mean, the, 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 the point about uh, you to build uh, trust and, and the importance of transparency and the fact that it's been few cases that uh, of, 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 of such abuse under the current system and, and uh, the, the, the efforts to make sure that our, uh, the, the charitable sectors looks more like Canada and, and uh, that the, and, and there's a better re reflection of in, in, in the accountable system to ensure that the activities are indeed uh, uh, charitable as, as uh, to, I think would let, uh, address some of these issues and, and create that climate of of, of uh, trust between the, the, the charity sectors and, and, uh, and, and, and Canadian writ, writ large. There's a, there's, there's a, there's a follow-up question on, on, on this issue that's, that's popped in, and let me uh, jump to that. This from Marta Rands. We appear to know the number of charities. What we don't know are the number of nonprofits. How do we ensure the inclusion in whatever changes are made? This organization that uh, Marta works with uh, works primarily with new newish grassroots be PAC and LGBTQ folks and nonprofits that are serving key gaps in pandemic recovery. I would argue that the provision of access to justice for this critical sector should be a key component in building back better. Do you agree? Uh, yes, absolutely. Not-for-profits are organic, they are more nimble. I would add in civil society movements like Black Lives Matters uh, and not-for-profits, obviously, social enterprises, co-op groups. There are many, many versions of, of non-charities that charities could be working with. Uh, but I, I think uh, that if you empower local grassroots movements so that they are able to work with charitable dollars without being charities themselves, because most of these local nascent emerging not-for-profit groups would likely, uh, you know, not have the resources 
to become charities, nor would they want to. Uh, for various reasons. So I think uh, the time has absolutely come, as, 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 as someone on this panel said, charities have been in a box far too long with rigid walls. We need to, you know, create some porousness. I, I agree with the concerns about abuse uh, and, and watching out for them. But you, you know, we, we can't simply uh, lock the doors on charities because we are afraid they will do harm by, you know, the do no harm mantra actually prevents us from doing good and doing better. Uh, so absolutely, uh, the premise of your, of your question, I accept completely. Bruce, can you, can you mention the number of not-for-profits not in Canada? How do we know how many not-for-profits are out there? And, uh, 75,000. Well, we, we, you know, we're using really old data. I mean, I think it's somewhere actually around 90,000 because you often talk about 170,000 charities and nonprofits together. So it's roughly 90,000 nonprofits. But within that, there's obviously private benefit, and public benefit nonprofits, uh, everything from condo boards and golf courses to uh, service clubs. And so uh, I, I, I support what the senator says on this. So I think also, I think those of us who work in the sector need to be mindful that for the general public, they don't really delineate between charities and nonprofits. They use the language interchangeably. And I think as we seek to both do better and to this point around rebuilding trust and in, you know, with, with the communities that we serve, acknowledging that we're part of a sector that the, the, the society views us as being all together because of the use of interchangeable language, it will be important for us to be able to know more about the nonprofit side of the equation um, as we go forward. Larry, anything to add? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think um, maybe uh, I could mention here that the report, the first report that we have not yet uh, been able to table publicly, but which is in the hands of the minister now, um, the, the subtitle of this report is Towards a Federal Regulatory Environment that Enables and Strengthens the Charitable and Nonprofit Sector. So we're, you know, we're trying to get across to this minister and to all the ministers, hopefully, uh, that we are interested in a regime that is, as Bruce said, is going to free the sector and not uh, inhibit it. Again, I mean, the, the COVID crisis has underlined the the constraint of the of the current system. And PFC is. Uh, a platform of uh, foundation are working together to support some of the most affected and most racialized and poorest uh, neighborhoods in Montreal. And um, they are almost not, not, all of them are not for profits uh, the, the, uh, without the charitable, uh, charitable status. And we have to put these direction and uh, control agreements for these uh, organizations. They were very partnerstic arrangements that uh, we have to put in place to, 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 support, to support the work. Um, let, let me uh, move on to the next question that we have on, on the list here. And uh, it's uh, uh, on the issue of impact investment. Uh, uh, it goes a bit outside of the, uh, of the scope where we talked so far. But so can you talk more about how we incorporate impact investing as a lever for change on the project issue and how the Canadian government and CRA will look at that as an activity? Was that? I'm, I'm afraid I don't know if who should answer that question. Okay. John Mark, so, why so, don't so, you tell so, us? So, so uh, let's start with Hillary. Uh, All right. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, there's lots um, that the CRA could be doing uh, without getting into questions of investment policy. Uh, you know, one of the difficulties here is that um, investment policies are actually. I think um, technically uh, provincial matters, not federal. Um, the federal government regulates the sector through the Income Tax Act, uh, and it doesn't really constitutionally have the power to engage in regulation of the um, investment policies of charities. So that being said, um, there are such things as program-related investments, which uh, foundations and charities um, can, uh, can use. And there is guidance that the CRA has put together uh, that tries to clarify what they understand to be program-related investing. Again, it's been extremely cautious guidance, um, and you know, with lots of guardrails that you know are, are 
are difficult for people to understand and um, therefore I don't see uh, as much uh, investing going on or social investing going on sort of through program related investing um, as I think is possible. Um, ideally, and this is something that PFC actually has argued for in the past, um, that guidance should be uh, reviewed and uh, it has been, but it needs to be expanded. And I think that um, there should be a better understanding of the scope that foundations have and that charities have to engage in that. Now, there's a whole big field of impact investing in general. And, uh, you know, I think in general, it, it, the, the idea that charities should be able to deploy their assets uh, broadly um, across a, a number of uses, um, whether it's direct funding, loans, guarantees, um, investments, direct investments, uh, just investments in funds. I mean, all of that should be possible. Um, there is a lack of clarity in this area. I think the regulatory um, system has not helped uh, and the split between federal and provincial has also inhibited um, charities from being as active as they could be. Um, but, you know, the whole field actually has advanced significantly, uh, you know, in the last, even the last five years. And I think that's just the market moving. That's not government moving, that's the market moving. Um, so I think that um, we're going to see now, you know, a significant jump forward in terms of uh, impact investing in ways that don't require a change in federal regulation. So not entirely to the question, but related uh, is, is, of course, the connection between it, with impact invest investment and the social finance fund, which has been uh, announced in June 2018. Uh, now a bunch of us parliamentarians are working to ensure that it actually uh, uh, is accelerated in its investment and and in, in its and its setup because the urgency of today actually trumps any plan. Sorry for that word. Any plan that plans that we may have had earlier. But there is a a, a, a rising tide of interest in in charities and non charities doing business differently along with institutional uh, uh, wealth, institutional money and private foundations in, in different ways. So I think in a way, uh, I mean, if I can, you know, I look for silver linings. That's the way my personality is constructed partly because of my life story. I think one of the, uh, the, the real benefits coming out of this crisis is we are more open to what we would, I'm not going to call these ideas disruptive, but ideas that have that that were necessary before, but they're getting a different kind of wind behind their sails now. Yeah, and this this is a topic for another webinar altogether. Yes. We've, we've had webinars in the past on the impact investment. We'll have more in the future in, in terms of the social finance funds as well. Um, the, the other questions rolling in, including one from uh, Sylvie Tracy from the Tracy Foundation. And, and, and there's a question about the disbursement quota in terms of, you know, we, we've heard the senator about the uh, own view. Is that something that the, uh, the, the committee is raising with uh, uh, government? And maybe uh, if not, uh, if you have a, your own personal take about- uh, uh, this, this, the disbursement quota was covered in the Senate Charities report with only one recommendation that the government take a hard look at whether the disbursement quota should be set in statute versus regulation. And we asked the government to consider that. We, we, we were risk averse in terms of saying do this or that for good reason. When, one, when it is in statute, it's, it's much more difficult to change it. And maybe that's a good thing. When it's in regulations, it, it's much easier to change it. And maybe that's a good thing. But at the same time, it could become a political football, you know, changing periodically far too often from political ideology to political ideology. My position on the disbursement quota is, is my own personal position. It, it, I, I'm not uh, 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 repeating a recommendation of the report because it was not in the report. Uh, Hillary and Bruce, I mean, the, uh, the press talk more about the uh, unintended, unintended consequences of, of, of uh, raising any, of any, ch any change in disbursement quota. Uh, yeah. Hillary, you want to say a few things? Go ahead, Hillary. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, you know, I mean, I'm on record on this. Uh, you know, I, 
my view on the disbursement quota is that it's a it's a blunt instrument. It was never really intended to uh, be used, I think, as a, a way of forcing uh, X amount of money to be spent. It was meant to uh, ensure that you couldn't uh, simply give money, put it into a foundation, and then never spend it. Uh, but it was not intended as a way to sort of set some sort of, uh, you know, target for funders. And it's a minimum. I keep saying it's a minimum. You can you can <laughs> go over that minimum anytime you want. That would be totally fine. Uh, and in fact, a number of foundations have been going over that minimum regularly over the years, even before the crisis. Uh, I know a lot of PFC members were well over the three and a half percent. You know, it was more like four and a half, five percent. But there is an issue here, which is the value of the long term. And, you know, my view on this is that the long term uh, is it's as important as the present. Uh, it, it can't be uh, diminished because of the proportional uh, sort of urgency of what we face in the present. You know, the, the, yes, of course, we have a crisis. And of course, foundations and funders should be spending more right now to support uh, the sector through this crisis. No doubt about it. And, you know, I, I applaud the efforts that have been made to encourage foundations to spend more. But using the, the tool of the disbursement quota, it, it's a blunt instrument that may have unintended consequences. You know, think about the fact that a, a foundation could meet a much higher disbursement quota simply by writing a very large check to a university. The university will accept it very happily. It's nothing against universities, but that doesn't accomplish the purpose of getting more money out into the community, into the hands of organizations that are vulnerable and that are serving vulnerable populations. So unless you start going down the slippery slope of, as a government, of regulating what you spend the money on, um, which I think is a very slippery slope, um, I just think you, we should leave the disbursement quota alone, continue to insist that it is a minimum, not a maximum, and allow foundations and endowments to, to, uh, to do the right thing, essentially, to, to be uh, recalled to their purpose, to their, to their public benefit purpose, and to make those decisions with the community in mind, both for the short term and the long term. Bruce? Yeah, maybe I'll just j jump in with uh, with one comment here. And again, I think this has got more my Imagine Canada hat on because we're getting a lot of questions about this because as you can see, there are a variety of instruments, whether it's the disbursement quota, matching program, uh, tax credit changes that are being proposed because there's a sense that the sector needs an infusion of revenue or capital. Um, I, I think from our perspective right now, we're working through this in the sense as to what would Imagine Canada's position. I mean. We think that public policy has to be well researched and thoughtful because it takes time to change once it's in implemented. And I, I think the question that we're trying to really wrap our heads around right now is, you know, the specific proposal that's being floated is to raise the DQ to 10%. And, um, you know, we don't, we don't want to support public policy that creates an unwinnable solution for the funding community in order to meet the 10% they may have to be in violation of trust agreements, or if they violate the trust agreements, uh, or if they don't do that, then they could be offside with CRA. That seems to be an unwinnable solution. So I think we got more work to do on this to understand, A, the power of the instrument, and is that the solution that many are looking for, and or what does it mean for those who uh, would be tasked with honoring that obligation, and does it put them in an untenable situation? So Jean-Marc, may I yes. briefly uh, make a comment here? Uh, I didn't go into the substance of uh, the disbursement quota outside to say I support uh, raising it. I agree with Hillary that the disbursement quota is the floor. It is not the ceiling. And I agree with her uh, that there are many foundations who do much, much more. But I think the whole idea is about raising the floor on the issue of where the money goes to. I agree with her completely again. It is impossible for us and it should not be it should not be made possible to direct charitable funding uh, to certain kinds of uh, institutes, even though they might be more in need than universities. At the same time, I do believe that, especially today, 
uh, given our, our, you know, the, the time we find ourselves in with government being called on uh, to do more and more and is doing more and more. And frankly, a time will come when, when and I, I see this almost every day in the Senate, when the, you know, we're spending at large now and we need to spend at large, but the reckoning will come for Canadians. It will not just come for the government, it will come for ordinary Canadians. And these are, private foundations are in my view, uh, um, uh, trustees of tax exempt public dollars. These are public dollars in private hands. And even though, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the needs of the future uh, call for, you know, endowments to grow so that they can meet the needs of the future. I will also say this, that the needs of the future are, are um, will only grow if the needs of today are not addressed. And if you, if you postpone addressing the needs of today, you are inherently buying into ballooning of costs. Youth, un youth unemployment is expensive to resolve today. It will be that much more expensive to resolve when the youth are 30 or 40 years old. And as for tomorrow, you know, you've all seen the rise of new foundations that have, uh, that have been created as a result of new wealth that has been created by, you know, out of the box uh, uh, business solutions. So I, 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 I personally, I think 10% is not doable. I want a, a solid uh, in, uh, debate that the government has with stakeholders to iron out uh, the intended and the unintended consequences so that we, we can make a reasoned policy debate, but we must have these consultations. That would be the first step. Thank you. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put my PFC ad for a second. Uh, the the uh, evidence-based approach, I think, is key on this, on, on, on this question. We know from our research uh, using CRA data that the disbursement quota of a, fun, a foundation prior to uh, COVID, so prior to the, the, the data from 2010 to 2017, this person quota on average was 4.1 percent, uh, so above the floor of 3.5. Uh, but the the uh, that any any conversation moving forward should be based on on, 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 on data and, and uh, consultation with all the stakeholders. Um, time is wrapping up. Can we we do have a question from Laura Butler, uh, thanking uh, the, the the panelists for your fantastic learning opportunities. What can foundations do to practically support your efforts? Whether it's the bill, the recommendation of the committee, what can we do now to move to move forward? Senator. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I was I was going to try and suggest it to you, but I'm so glad Laura has asked it. So the bill has is tabled in the Senate. I speak to it as soon as we get assisted dying out of the way, which could be sometime this month. And, and I really welcome this opportunity, Jean-Marc, because some of the questions have alerted me to the concerns of Canadians and I should, be, I should be ready for them. How you can support this bill is to engage with your sector organizations. I imagine Canada is leading its own independent campaign on, uh, on, on the bill. Uh, my office obviously will, is also doing the same. Cooperation Canada has got a campaign on. I don't know, Jean-Marc, if PFC will have a campaign. I encourage you to have a campaign based on everything I have said. This should be of great interest to private foundations. And, you know, your own campaign to, to, uh, uh, to affect the change would be most welcome. Uh, individuals and individual organizations can speak to their MP. You know, you can do the, the usual thing, you know, but the unusual thing is, you know, PFC could write an op-ed and publish it. Uh, you know, those are the sector organizations and sector leaders matter so much more because you've got such a diverse uh, community of charities, it's impossible to get your arms around all of them. So we need the voices of sector leaders on this bill and I would welcome that more than anything else. Thank you. And, and uh, I mean, this, your bill addressed a long standing uh, uh, ask for PFC and for many others. So uh, we, we, will, we will endorse it uh, in any ways we, that are feasible and practical in the next, next few weeks. Hilary what can we do? Bruce, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's a similar message. When the report comes out, to A, read it, 
B, talk to those organizations that you're engaged with in, in your community and invite them to talk with their local representatives about the importance of these recommendations, the importance of the work that's being done. We hear consistently that the kind of change that we're advocating for will be greatly enhanced if members of all parties go back to the respective caucus meetings and say, why are people in my community asking me about direction and control or, or any of the other recommendations that are coming forward? It's time to create a buzz in this country about social good at a moment when the spotlight has been shone on the need for support to Canadians like never before. It's, it's kind of a moment in time here and we're hoping to be able to use it. Hillary. Yeah, and I guess as a, as a final point, um, you know, addressed to foundations, um, remember, we're okay to do public policy, dialogue and development activities. It's okay to advocate, actually. It's okay to go behind the scenes, too. It's okay to fund the work of others who are advocating, uh, you know, as long as you can relate it to your charitable purpose. Um, and, you know, broadly speaking, I think the green light has been given uh, you know, it is possible to get behind these kinds of campaigns, whether right up front, um, speaking out directly about it, or funding the work of others to speak out, uh, funding the work of Imagine, for example. I'm giving you a plug, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, go fund Imagine. That would be one of the great, oh, PFC too, of course. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, the, the, the panelists and all the participants. I think there has been a, a substantive discussion. There's much more to, to, to go in, in, in greater depth, but the, the, uh, we had uh, with the, the committee's report that's coming with the bill. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a moment where we, we collectively come together to uh, get across the, the, the line to, 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 make, to make progress. So, uh, I, I look forward to continue working with, with all of you and in, in moving forward. Uh, I, I, I do want to plug in our next uh, webinar for ne the next uh, Wednesday, which is about uh, what we've learned from the COVID response as, uh, as, as foundation. Uh, and we have Susan Phillips from Carlton University and Jean-Marc Fontan from the Phil Lab, bringing more of a, of a uh, research academic perspective of what we learn from case studies and uh, disc uh, a monthly discussion with a group of, of CEO leaders. Uh, so the, it's going to be a very rich uh, conversation to follow up from our uh, presentation that came more from the communities and leaders in the field a, a month ago. Uh, so to, to capture the learning and share and share that. And you all, you should see a short survey as you uh, leave the, uh, the, 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 the webinar. I encourage you to, to fill it up. It helps us uh, uh, prepare and plan for, for our, our programming for the rest of the year. So on that note, a grand merci uh, to, to all of you and to all the participants uh, for, for the very rich, rich conversation today.